Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today on cybersecurity tips. Um, today, you're going to learn insights, advice, and best practices to keep your digital life safe. This is, I feel like, a, an ever-evolving topic as technology shifts and changes, and we're always looking for information, right, to make sure that we're keeping ourselves protected and safe. I know personally in my, my work life, I feel very confident in this area because I have the Roosevelt University support, but sometimes in my personal life, I'm not sure how to, you know, make sure that um, everything in my digital life in, in that area is, is up to par. So I'm personally looking forward to hearing all of the great information we're going to receive today. Um, just a few um, reminders to please keep your mic muted throughout the presentation, just to make sure that everyone can hear um, all of the great information um, that Dan is gonna be sharing with us today. Um, also, if you do have questions, please feel free to chat them in the chat box um, throughout the presentation. We will try to get to as many of them as we can. If we don't, um, there'll be some time at the end um, for um, Dan to answer your questions. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker today, um, Dan Lichner, who's the Assistant Vice President for Technology Infrastructure right here at Roosevelt University. Um, Dan's experience, experience information technology leader, not only in higher education, but also in healthcare industries. Um, he's skilled in IT strategy, business alignment, data centers, networking, vendor management, and IT services management. He holds his MS in finance and MBA in management information systems. Um, so Dan, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, so I will go ahead and turn it over to you to begin. All right, thank you. Thanks, Christy. Um, so thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, this is a uh, out of the ordinary um, activity for me to do. So I'm, I'm glad there's the interest and uh, I'm glad that uh, Roosevelt IT Services uh, Department was able to provide a resource that uh, was relevant. Um, so as Christy said, I'm Dan Lichter. I'm, uh, I run infrastructure for, for Roosevelt uh, on the tech side. And um, apart from the resume, I guess I'll mention a couple other things. I'm the father of three, two, two kids of which I just had to chase off from wanting to start a, a Fortnite gaming session here. Um, I told them come back in an hour. Um, and I'm a musician. Um, and you can see my, my pink bass right there. Um, I love tropical fish and reptiles and, and, and all kinds of things. Um, and the reason I mention that is because on my evenings and weekends, I would much rather be doing those things than fighting cyber crime. Um, and um, I need everybody's help uh, to do that because there's responsibility on everybody's part to protect their own credentials, to protect their own data, uh, and to protect the data and information that, um, that we are entrusted with by our students or our peers or our customers or, or whomever uh, that we work with. Um, you know, in my role at Roosevelt, I've got to protect you, the alumni. I've got to protect the students. I've got to teach the students to protect themselves, which is sometimes the biggest challenge. Um, I've got to protect our staff and faculty and teach them to protect themselves. So uh, that's kind of the context that uh, I wanted to set up here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about breaches to begin with um, once I get in the right window. And I'm going to turn my camera off. So. I'm not distracting myself, um, but uh, let me get back to PowerPoint and all right, good. Um, so a little bit, uh, a little bit about data compromises and why we're trying to protect from them. Um, here's kind of a, a list uh, of some of the things that can happen if you're not properly protecting your data. Um, for a university like Roosevelt is really the context that I'm kind of starting from. Uh, I'll talk about some of what we're, what we're trying to protect and why. And then uh, from there, I'll go a little bit into what you can do um, and things for yourselves to keep in mind uh, in, as you uh, traverse our digital world. Um, so as I said, you know, I'm trying to protect our current students, but also, you know, if, if if you see in the news and you see breaches or things like that come up in the news more and more often, um, you know, we have the responsibility to 
to, to, to protect the data of our students. And if we don't, uh, that could chase away the interest of future students, which we need. Um, that could chase away interest from, say, uh, donors or uh, uh, grant writers or things like that, where um, you know, we, we definitely need to maintain the, the reputation of Roosevelt. Um, also attracting the right employees or the right faculty. You know, if we're in the news for the wrong reasons, uh, that's, that's gonna be a problem. Um, there's also the direct or indirect costs relating to trying to repair damage done by data breaches or hacks. Um, and I guess I, uh, I'm presuming that everybody knows what a data breach is, but that basically is loss of loss of data or information where um, the the personal information of our students, faculty, staff, or other uh, constituent is somehow hacked or released into the into the environment or um, hold, held hostage. In some cases, we'll talk a little bit about that. That's ransomware. Um, and with um, more and more identity theft every day, you know, it's, uh, that's the type of thing we're trying to protect from. Uh, so if anybody needs clarification on what I mean by data breaches or compromises, just let us know. Uh, and I'll try to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we, we are under regulatory requirements uh, to protect this data. Um, you know, we, there are penalties in lawsuits and, and all kinds of things where these things can come into play if, if, if we don't do a good job of protecting this. Um, now, uh, there have been in the news, I mentioned, you know, there, there have been some breaches lately um, or over the last year or so. Uh, North Carolina College had to cancel their classes because of an attack. Um, Michigan State it was threatened to leak data and they had to, uh, well, I think they restored from backups and were able to avoid that. But um, uh, University of Utah actually paid $457,000 to, to, to get their data back from, from a, a, an evildoer that, to, that, that hacked them. Um, another case where um, by, so nowadays, right, we've got smart everything. Uh, smart thermostats, the nest, things like that. So there was actually most of the time, you know, heating and cooling uh, uh, equipment is generally network aware these days. And there was a Michigan K through 12 district that uh, that was hacked by um, by by an attack on their HVAC system, and they used that to bypass firewalls and things like that, and to uh, to infect them with ransomware. Um, University of California paid $1.1 million to get its data back. In the public sector, that was one of the biggest, uh, the, the biggest ransoms that was held. Um, and they had to spend a lot of money on negotiating, uh, bringing in, I don't know that they use the FBI, but they use bring in professional negotiators to try to, to try to get these things done. And what I always wonder myself is if you pay this money, what's the guarantee that you're actually going to get your data back? That's what I always wonder. Um, and to, to bring things a little closer to home, Columbia College in Chicago, uh, it was the third college in a week, and this is a few weeks back, or actually a couple months ago, I don't remember the date of this, but um, there was a ransomware attack right down the street at Columbia Co College of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> So a little bit about what we're doing at Roosevelt to fight this. Um, we talk about the three pillars of cybersecurity, and that is people, process, and technology. Um, so in my role, again, I'm uh, sort of an engineering, you know, I'm an IT nerd, right? I'm behind the scenes myself. I, I try to uh, stay out of the spotlight and make everybody else look good. Um, so I do that by providing reliable and, and re reliable and uh, confidentiality and uh, making sure that the data that you're trying to access is, is trustable and it's available. Um, and we have a lot of technology tools in place to do that. It's actually, don't let my uh, staff hear me say it, but the easy part is to manage the technology itself. Um, firewalls and, and uh, there's all kinds of acronyms, the um, EDR and which is endpoint uh, 
detection and recovery or antivirus. There's the, the technologies, the, the, those are not the hard part, right? We can, we can usually detect an attack, um, not usually, but we can often detect an attack and prevent it. Um, uh, but where it gets trickier is uh, in the process and the people side of things. So some of what we do, for example, in process is we run uh, scans against our network assets to make sure that um, there are no known vulnerabilities that are available uh, for an attacker to, uh, to, to take advantage of. Um, what we would do if we find known vulnerabilities is then we do our, use our technology updates uh, to block those vulnerabilities. Um, and that gets us really far. That kind of guides how we do our technology and how we manage the actual hardware and software itself. Um, we also set up, and this is an ongoing thing, to develop policies. And we our, our policies at this point, we're following a NIST, a national standard, to make sure that we're covering all aspects um, based on industry best practices and research and and uh, a whole lot of smart people all co collaborating together to figure out what's the best way to uh, try to manage these things, or at least to know what needs to be managed. And then we make um, informed decisions on, on how we want to do these things around Roosevelt. Um, now, the hardest part is, um, is the people, right? And, and this is, we've, we've come a long way in the last 10 years, which is a good thing because the hackers have too. Um, what we have found is that uh, we're, we're, we're trying to develop a culture and increase the awareness and the responsibility level uh, of the people that have that have and use the data uh, that we're talking about here. Um, because if you uh, if you succumb to an attack that's a targeted attack and you provide your username and password to uh, to a hacker, um, that that hacker could then use that information to to collect other identity information. Uh, for example, if Christy were not so such a such a great um, uh, aware user and, and taking great care with uh, all the the alumni data that she has access to, um, you know that that sort of thing could be leaked, and we that's what we're really trying to fight here. Um, so some of the things we do at Roosevelt is we have lots of meetings and uh, presentations like this one. Uh, that's how this this got started is because we uh, did some training and a presentation to the alumni department to make sure that they understood um, what what some of these uh, issues are that we face. Um, and we do that with our faculty and our staff as well. And we're trying to do that with our students. Um, some of the things we, we do is um, we do simulated attacks so that we see uh, who might need more help with fighting um, phishing attacks and things like that, breaches with email or clicking uh, uh, invalid links or risky links. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, we're providing some interactive videos and, 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 and training sessions uh, for all of our staff and faculty. Um, and we're doing things like uh, t visiting with departments or divisional meetings and giving presentations like this, uh, making sure that new employees get onboarded uh, with, with some education on what they're responsible for and uh, where to turn for help in the event of, of suspicion of any sort of um, cybersecurity issues. Um, so that, that that's a little bit about what Roosevelt is trying to do. Um, I guess I can st stop here for a second and see if there have been any questions so far on kind of Roosevelt's position. Um, um, so. No questions so far. Great. Hopefully nobody's. Uh, hopefully everybody's still interested and engaged here. Um, all right. So what what I'm going to do is at this point I'm going to give uh, some more direct tips and tricks and some hints and things to, for, for, for all of us to keep in mind as we, again, navigate, uh, navigate the internet or um, the, the social media world or um, whether, and this, this all applies, whether it's, it's your personal life or your professional life. Um, you know, when you're, for example, when you're making a big donation to Roosevelt, make sure you're donating to really to Roosevelt. So get in touch with Christy and make that big donation and make sure it's not going to somebody who spelled the name wrong and is trying to 
uh, to, to separate you from your hard-earned dollars. Um, now, the probably the biggest thing that we try to promote is never share your passwords and never give your passwords away no matter what. So you might get a phone call, uh, you might get an email that says, um, hey, your account has been hacked. Uh, please give me your password and your username so that we can fix it. Now, I am an IT professional and I work with several of them. And I promise you, none of us, no IT professional or s support agent or anyone is ever going to ask you for that information. We might ask you for something to confirm who you are based on what we already know about you, uh, based on what you have shared with us. Right. So we might, um, you know, sometimes it might be, well, just tell me your zip code just to confirm that you match your your records in our system. And then I can do a password reset that will let you reset your own password. But I'm never going to ask you for that information. Um, so. So that's the first step. Right. An important line of defense is what this this slide here. Um, but we use passwords. Think about how many different passwords you have and how tempting it can be to just use the same one everywhere. The problem there is if you if you lose that password or somebody figures that out in one system, all of a sudden they gain access to a lot of other areas. So if you use the same password at your bank that you do for your Gmail account and you give that out, then you've lost access. Or potentially, you've lost access to both of those. Um, some some of the things uh, when you're creating your passwords is avoid ones that are easy to guess. Don't use your children's names or your own name, um, things like that. Um, and I'll give an example of how to construct a good password, but there is an example given here where they say to doctor a random word or phrase with a, with a mix of letters, numbers, and symbols. So you see how they turn the word Pittsburgher into something that's a little bit more obscure and that you, it would be harder for somebody to guess. Um, at the same time, you are able to remember it because you can say the word, but you just have to change the spelling. Um, again, the important takeaway here is don't don't share your passwords. Don't share your passwords with your your coworkers, your boss. If your boss says to share your password, I would. Uh, ask HR for something like that, um, or uh, I won't even, and my boss would never ask me for my password, uh, but we're in this business, right? So, um, but those sorts of things you just have to be very careful with. Um, here's a few more tips is try to use long passwords. We recently switched uh, our password requirements to require 12 characters long instead of eight. Um, again, create use pa unique passwords on for for each site. Don't write them down because somebody gets that piece of paper. They've got uh, they've got your passwords. And nowadays there are a lot of applications um, where you can use to generate random passwords and store them. And and um, you know the Chrome Chrome browser can do this. I believe Firefox can. And there are uh, as mobile device apps like LastPass, KeePass, or 1Password uh, that you can use to manage all these passwords so that you don't forget them. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, and just a little disclaimer, uh, I'm not recommending any of those particular examples that I listed there. That's just a starting point for you to do some research and, and just look for a password manager app. Um, I know PC Magazine, uh, they have an article on how to choose uh, your best, you know, uh, how to choose an app that's appropriate for your needs. Um, a lot of times when you're resetting passwords, you have to answer questions like what city did you grow up in or what is your pet's name? Um, but think about when you're choosing those those questions that, that a lot of that information may not be secret, right? If you have that stuff posted on, on Facebook uh, or some other, you know, on LinkedIn, perhaps it might, it might have some, some hints that would help uh, a hacker figure out your password. Uh, so be careful of what sorts of things you use. Um, uh, sometimes you can, you can even trick yourself um, uh, into using those questions to remind you of something else, like what is your pet's name? You might, um, you might remember, remind yourself that I'm going to use that question, but I'm going to use my car as, as my, as the answer. 
uh, what is your favorite book? Well, maybe you just use that as a reminder to your favorite author instead of the book. And that way it's a little bit, a little bit more obscure, security by obscurity, right? Um, and one of the things I mentioned was past phrases. And this is a really good way, uh, I, I believe, and it's, I'll give you a secret or I'll let you in on a secret. It's how I, uh, how I manage my own passwords. Um, and, and that is to use past phrases. And I'm gonna give an example here of how we can build a passphrase. Um, uh, and it, so there's the little rhyme in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? And uh, from that, we can we can take the initials of all that and shorten that down. And you'll see the the next line there, I N 1492, the numbers, then C S T O B as the lowercase letters, right? So now we just turned that little rhyme that's easy to remember, and I turned that into a password, right? Now, if we count that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, that's only 11 characters. And we recommend and also require 12 or more characters. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a percent sign at the end of that, just to make it a little bit more obscure. And now it's 12 characters to re meet the requirements. Um, however, we can do, uh, I think, one better from that. And if you go to the final line, and this is, what I would recommend as a good passphrase, um, as 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 gnarly as that appears, that that's actually quite memorable if you think about it, right? Because we've now taken the num numeral two and we've wrote that out as TWO. We capitalize Columbus for with a C, uh, which is easy to remember because it's a proper noun, so we capitalize that. We're replacing the letter O with the number zero. Um, capitalizing B just for kicks and adding that percent sign. So hopefully this is clear on how we kind of walk through going from this phrase in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue to create the password, uh, capital I N numbers 149, then T W O capital C S T zero B percent. Um, so I'm going to pause here a second and make sure that uh, this makes sense or if there's any questions on this, um, or even just some feedback that uh, it's if, if this is something that's useful to you. Um, give that one second. And we do have one question from Martha asking, doesn't using a password manager app make you vulnerable to hacking? It can if you, if you, so usually a password app, um, it is going to require one master password uh, before you can get in there. And, and, and usually the, the, the contents, all your passwords stored in the password app will be encrypted and will be strongly encrypted. That will be very difficult for somebody, even if they got that file, to figure out what the passwords are from that file. The only way to lose that would be to lose both your password app as well as the main password that unlocks that app. Now, another, a better way to do that is to use if your phone, um, for example, if your phone has a thumbprint reader or a fingerprint reader, you would use your fingerprint to unlock the password app. Um, and that way it's, it's protected by something you are uh, that, you know, it, 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 it's very difficult for somebody to get a hold of that. Um, short of violence, right? And uh, most of us, uh, well, I'm not that important that somebody's going to try to steal my thumbprint by uh, violent means. But um, hopefully that answers the question. I think you, you just have that what, what the password management app will do is let you protect just one single resource. Uh, and you can put all your effort into protecting that um, and not have to worry about keeping track of other passwords or other apps. So I use a mix. I use a password manager built into my Chrome browser. Um, and then I also, I, I do things like this passphrase and I customize it based on different sites. And I have in my own head, um, I know how I do that, you know? So for example, with this one, does 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue? And then I might take the, uh, the site for which I'm creating a password, and I do a similar uh, abbreviation or shorthand for that website and, and convert that into a way 
that uh, also fits into my password in a unique way that I can remember, but that is very difficult for somebody else to guess. Um, you know, a very bad example would be taking the word Google and just using the consonants and dropping out the, vo the, the, the vowels. So you just put GGL um, at the end of a password for the Google site. Uh, and then you can remember that because if your rule is to always use the consonants of the site, you can, you can make your password stronger and more memorable. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, so I'm hoping that this exercise to, to create a strong passphrase, uh, you know, is something useful and you can, you can apply this in your own day to day, um, because, and, and never share it with anybody. Uh, if, if that's the only takeaway today, um, <laughs> use a strong password and don't share it with anybody. That's what I ask. Um, I'll move on, uh, to a thing called multi-factor authentication, which we, you're going to see and probably more and more frequently we're seeing this uh, on sites. Um, we've started to use it at Roosevelt uh, for certain applications. Uh, your banks probably use it, um, but multi-factor authentication combines um, not just your password, but then which is a single factor, right? That's something you know. You, you know your password, that's one factor. We add in another layer, which is perhaps something you have, which a lot of times we're nowadays it's our phone. So um, with the, if, I, if I'm using the phone as a second factor, then what I'm doing is sending that uh, ident or, uh, authorization code via text or a phone call uh, so that you have proven that you have your phone because if you receive that message on your phone, I know that you have it. And it, so you type in your password and then it sends you a message on your phone and you type in that code. Now that's two factors, right? That I've, I've and that's usually enough. Um, but you add a third thing like your a fingerprint. Uh, my phone has a fingerprint reader. My kids does not, uh, or maybe it does. Two out of three. Um, uh, and in that way, you know, think about it, you, you have your thumbprint that's unlocking your phone and you're using that to, receive, to retrieve a code that was texted to you by me uh, to confirm that that's you when you put in your password, right? So it's multiple la layers and it's really hard for, for somebody almost, I won't say impossible by any means, but it, it's hard for, for somebody to, to, um, uh, to impersonate that. Uh, with those levels of protection. Um, and you'll see more and more uh, multi-factor or often called two-factor authentication because they're sending a text or a message via email uh, to your email account because that's something you quote unquote have, right? You, you have access to your email account, a, a different email account, for example, Google, uh, instead of your Ro 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 Roosevelt email. Um, so one of the things we talked about was never share your password, right? So you probably, you're used to spam, just junk mail. Uh, we just delete it, um, advertisements that are unwanted, things like that. But a lot of times nowadays we're receiving email that's trying to trick us. Um, so they might be trying to get us to click on a suspicious link that we have to pay attention to what that link is. I and mean, they might say, oh, you, you know, click this link, uh, complete a survey, and we'll give you a $25 Amazon card. Now, sometimes that's legitimate, uh, but you've got to be very careful and, and, and be skeptical and, and you know, watch out for, for things that are too good to be true. Um, so they promise money or prizes or maybe win, uh, you know, click here for your free iPhone or iPad, you know, and it's, if it's too good to be true, it probably is, right? So my, my mom taught me that. Uh, um, and it still applies in cybersecurity. Um, they do things like try to scare you, um, impersonating, say, an IRS agent or a police or things like that, um, or saying, hey, your account is past due. And you might not even have this account, but they scare you into ignoring that fact. Uh, sometimes it would be attachments to your, e to your email that are, you know, that are contain viruses or ransomware. Um, sometimes they, they 
include links in an email that are not legitimate. So it might it might appear to be taking you to say uh, a Google search, but it's actually taking you to an alternative site. And you can usually, by hovering your mouse over a link, you can usually see where it's truly going. Um, and again, you know, sometimes before you click a link, if it's to your bank, call your bank uh, or, 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 or open your browser directly to your bank and log in yourself rather than clicking an email link. Uh, that's what I usually do is I don't, I don't click links and emails. I just open the, I, I open it myself directly or manually. Um, also be careful of when somebody's asking you for sensitive information, like I, my, the example I gave of, of uh, you know, you a claim that your account has been hacked, please provide your username and password to regain access, right? That's never going to be a legitimate request. Um, so if somebody's requesting information that just seems inappropriate, just uh, don't don't succumb to those those traps, and uh, contact your IT department or you can contact us um, at uh, help desk at roosevelt.edu uh, if you if you think it's suspicious. Your employer might have different ways to treat these things. Uh, they might have a way for you to report spam. You can if you have something that you know is a spam or uh, or uh, you know it is a phishing message. It's um, illegitimate. You can send that to spam at roosevelt.edu uh, for your Roosevelt email account. That is, um, please don't forward from your other uh, from your other lines of business uh, emails. Um, but and then that helps us to do some analysis and perhaps block it and keep that from attacking the next person. Uh, any questions on this? Okay. No additional questions right now, Dan. Great. Oh, it looks like Sherry B has a question. Yes. Sherry B. Williams. Sherry, do you want to unmute and ask? Hi, how are you? Hi, great. Um, my question is, um, you um, said that the two-factor authentication is often used, and, and I've seen that and used that. Mm -hmm. And when they ask for a thumbprint, so, you know, what hackers do is they hack. So what you're saying is that they are not able to disable the fingerprint authentication because that's to me would be what they would try to do if more people are moving to using the thumbprint. Since they can't get it, they would try to just disable that. Yeah, uh, that, that's a that's a that's a good point and I'm sure they're trying to do anything and everything they can think of um, to, to try to do that. Um, typically, you know, I think that the fingerprint readers on our, you know, I think uh, laptops have them now and there's different ways to do it. I think they're pretty safe. Um, I mean, do your own due diligence and research and, and, and Google that to see if, um, you know, if, if your particular device has a reliable fingerprint scanner um, you know, they're, they're going to, the, 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 the hackers will, will stop at nothing. Um, you know, and it, that, that protects if you're, if you perhaps have your device lost or stolen, uh, that might give one extra protection. Um, but that's why it's multiple factors, right? It's not just the one thing we try to depend on multiple factors. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Great question. Okay, um, so good transition there with that question because we'll talk a little bit about mobile device security, right? Protect your phone. Um, most of us have the smartphone at this point and really rely on it uh, for everything. Um, and if you're like me, you get lots of calls lately about uh, extending the life of your car with a new warranty or things like that or um, uh, you know, so we're getting spam or I get unwanted text messages now. So they call it smishing, which is for SMS phishing, smishing, I guess is the new term for that, uh, where instead of sending you an email, they're sending you a text message trying to get you to click a link or to respond with private data. Um, so, 
you know, I mean, one way to do it is to treat your device like cash, right? Don't leave it unattended. Don't just leave it sitting there at Starbucks while you go to the washroom, um, it, which can be a challenge, right? I leave my, yeah, I'm tempted to leave my, uh, my laptop or my phone to, to save my place at Starbucks or you just hold it, right? Uh, uh, to be glib. Um, uh, also make sure you're using a lock, you know, using a pin on your device, um, you know, six digits or I th some still allow you to do four digits, but uh, try to use at least six digits. And that's just to access your device. Again, use your fingerprint ID if you can. Um, make sure you're backing up the data in your phone in case it breaks and it, uh, or you drop it or, or what have you, but uh, you can back up or sync your data to iCloud or if you use an Android phone that most of that just syncs automatically to your Google account. Um, uh, another thing is, you know, be careful what you say. If you're, um, perhaps if you call your bank and they ask you to verify some information, um, that that is, you know, you wanna make sure that, that you're not being eavesdropped upon. Um, Again, as I mentioned, you know, phone calls, phony phone calls or text messages for, for you know, junk, junk mail or uh, uh, robocalling, um, you know, don't give information out to those if they're unsolicited. Um, and also be careful about, you, you know, if a lot of apps want to use GPS tracking, well, think about it. If you're tracked, if you know you're not, if you're tracking, if you're being tracked, uh, by your app, which sometimes can be very useful because it maybe gives you um, the, the location of the nearest Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts. However, and those are trusted applications. But if you tr try a different application that maybe somebody um, has hacked or is an illegitimate uh, application, they could use the GPS tracking to realize that you're not at home and that maybe that's the right time to break into your home. So things like that, you just have to be a little bit careful about, you know, not necessarily paranoid, but just uh, be sensitive. Um, also, and we'll get a little more into this, but uh, be careful of open Wi-Fi networks that, um, if you connect to an open Wi-Fi network, they could use that to infect your device with a virus or to try to s sniff, we call it sniffing, where, you're wa where, where you can watch the, the traffic going by on the network and try to steal personal information that way. Um, same with Bluetooth. If you connect, if you use Bluetooth, you, you, you be careful not to connect to mysterious devices or unknown, untrusted devices through Bluetooth because, again, hackers could use those to steal your information or gain access to your device. Um, a little bit more about using public Wi-Fi. Um, you know, when you do use public Wi-Fi, uh, check to make sure that you're using secure protocols in your browser. What I mean by this is you want uh, an address to be HTTPS colon slash slash um, uh, google.com versus just HTTP colon slash slash without the S. The S means it's secure. That means that traffic is encrypted. That means even if you're on public Wi-Fi, somebody is sniffing it, it's pretty difficult for them to see what the, the content is. So when you're sending a password to a website, make sure that it's is secured with that HTTPS. That's something real important to watch for. Um, if you're connecting to work, use a VPN, right? Log in to VPN, and that way you know that that encryption is, is protecting the, the uh, usually of VPN traffic, VPN stands for virtual private network, and that's setting up a secure connection between you and your employer's network. Um, and that way, any information that's passing through that uh, encrypted tunnel is protected. It won't be uh, sniffed on an open public network. Oops, went too far. Oh, there we go. Um, be careful shopping or sending any financial information when you're on a public network. Um, I, I, I still will shop on eBay or Amazon or something like that uh, if it's a trusted site. Um, I usually don't use a public network, but if I have to, um, you know, I, I think using the Amazon application within your device is, is safe enough. 
Um, another thing to do to avoid using public Wi-Fi, and this isn't a, um, on the slide, but is to just use the hotspot on your phone, for example. If you're, you, you could connect your tablet, your iPad, or your, uh, your, your laptop using your phone's uh, cellular connection instead of relying on uh, 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 open access Wi-Fi. Um, the last thing I want to mention is most of us have Wi-Fi at home, uh, so you want to make sure to configure that to use encryption or to to um, to close that down so that uh, people can't sniff on your your home Wi-Fi. So use a you use the configuration available for your your wireless access point or your wireless router at home to make sure you're using a password and encryption to connect there. Um, a little bit, I did mention using VPN to connect to your, your employer. Uh, so usually PII, which means personally identifiable information. Uh, that's any type of data that can directly identify or be combined to identify a specific individual. What, what we mean by that is that's information that could allow somebody to impersonate you or to steal more information about you or to gain access to um, uh, financial, uh, well, to your bank accounts or other data that you might have. Um, so this, when you're, if you're an employee that has access to personally identifiable information, you know, it's part of your job is to protect that data that you have access to. And this is a, something we run into uh, in higher ed a great deal because we, you know, have to have some of this information. Um, uh, so if you do have access to PII data, then um, make sure you're only sharing it with people that have access to it and it's only on a need to know basis. Um, don't store or collect any information if it's not critical to your business or to your, uh, your organization. Um, be careful when you, as, as an individual, be careful when you're disclosing any of that personal information. Like if, a lot of times they ask you for a phone number when you're checking out of a, or of a store or something, and I decline to give them my phone number, right? There's no reason, um, sometimes there's no reason for certain stores to have that information. So be careful, you know, we get used to just giving a phone number out when somebody asks us, um, you know, that's, you think twice before you share. Um, and then make sure you're, you know, make sure you're following any of your employer uh, policies surrounding collecting, sharing, or storing private information. Um, again, I've talking, talked a little bit about what Roosevelt does on that. Uh, and as a, as a, uh, a higher ed institution, um, we are privy, or we are uh, required to follow FERPA laws, right? Which have to do with privacy of our students. Uh, in in uh, healthcare, there's HIPAA. Um, so uh, based on those, those laws, most organizations will then have policies uh, that we need to follow. So check with your employers, uh, make sure you're doing your best to protect the information of your employer or your customers or your students or whatever you've got. Um, um, uh, one last thing, uh, I think we're wrapping up here pretty pretty shortly, but um, we're talking about, so I wanted to mention social networks um, such as Facebook or I guess Instagram uh, or uh, LinkedIn. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people use those to share information and stay in touch with people that, um, uh, you know, uh, but be careful about what information is available there and what information is public. Um, because hackers and scammers will use the information available on that to try to steal your information further, right? So if they, um, you know, they might pretend that they know you and try to make a new connection and uh, take advantage of, uh, of that connection to steal further information or try to scam you um, or just maybe try to sell you things that you don't wanna buy. Um, so particularly on Facebook, um, 
be 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 cautious of links that are posted that are from people you don't know or um uh requests for you know perhaps to complete a survey right they might actually be using a survey to just try to collect information to 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 scam you or hack you further um, be careful about downloading software or files that are linked on social networks because that could be used to deliver a virus or ransomware um, and then be careful about what you post publicly because uh, for example if you post you know the street you grew up on then all of a sudden um, if that's public information that could be used to hack your identity at your bank for example um, uh, or your your favorite book or things like that, right? So be careful about what's public. Um, you know, there's some things you might want to be public, but uh, just be cautious. Um, and I think, yeah, that was my, that was really all I had at this point. Uh, I wanted to open up for any questions about anything I had uh, to say. Yeah, and we do have some really great questions coming in. So I'll just, um, I'll go ahead and pose them to you. So um, Louise said, as we use ID and passwords for various sites and need to keep them, which is a safer location to maintain them? Hard drive, USB pen, manually or other? Uh, that's a great question. Um, So I'm, again, I'm not recommending any particular app for, but I would say a password manager of some sort. I, I personally, I'll tell you what I do, and that's I use, uh, I use an app called KeePass at times. Um, it's not an endorsement, but that is what has worked for me over time. And then I especially use, I use the, I'm a Chrome, bro, I'm a Chrome browser user. I used to use Firefox. Uh, I've become a Chrome user, and it does have. Uh, ability to store passwords. It generates uh, random character passwords that are pretty much impossible to be hacked. Um, and then I have a strong password that I remember to to give me access uh, to those passwords if I need to pull those out. Um, when you mention using a USB pen or USB key or writing them down. Be careful writing things down because that could be stolen. Um, you know, that's if you gain access physically to a spot, you know, you could look at somebody's desk or under their keyboard and you might find the, the post-it note that has their main password that, you know, uh, and then all of a sudden um, we've lost a lot of data potentially, right? So don't write your password down and put it under your keyboard because that's the first place somebody's going to look. Um, but the other thing to be careful of, if you put the, everything on a USB key and you lose that USB key, now you encrypted that USB key, so it's you're not going to lose that data. Somebody's not going to gain access to that data, but you might have lost it for yourself. And now all of a sudden you lost all your own passwords. So that's one reason that I use the Chrome browser built in uh, because it stores it and I can use that from my computer. I can use it from my tablet or from my desktop computer. Um, and again, I have one master password that uh, I will take to the grave with me, although I change it periodically, but I won't share that with, you know, my spouse or my boss or anybody. Um, and even though I kind of gave you a hint on how I build a password like that, right, that 1492 Columbus, Columbus sailed the ocean blue gives you an idea how I construct it, but you're never going to guess something like that. And I will never forget it because I know how to build it. Thanks, Dan. Um, another question coming in from Cassidy. Do you have any recommendations or guidance regarding antivirus software for Mac users? For Mac? Um, I don't. We use McAfee or McAfee, depending on how you say it, at Roosevelt. Um, I personally, I'm, let me see what I'm using at the moment. I think I use uh, it's, um, AVG is the one I use at home. I don't know if there's a Mac version. I'm primarily, I've become a, uh, I've traditionally been a Windows user. Um, and lately I'm more of an Android and a Chrome OS user. Um, but I've never been a Mac person, so that I can't help with. Um, thanks, Dan. Um, Richard had commented that Apple um, uses facial recognition in their uh, newer iPhones. Mm -hmm. 
that's something I'm not familiar with because I am an Android user. Mm. So can you just talk a little bit about your your thoughts around facial recognition and safety there? Yeah, I, I will trust the experts and they're building these things out and selling them as secure. Then, uh, I mean, I would do a little research and look at third party reviews, but I do that when I'm buying a, a, any sort of consumer item, right? So just do your due diligence and make sure that uh, before you you know, the, the, before you start using that facial recognition, you know, make sure that you've seen some reviews or some some trusted uh, third parties that say, yeah, this works. Um, that's not an area of my expertise. Although if my phone, if, if, if I, I do trust, well, I don't want to say I trust Google. Uh, I, I trust Google to an extent. And that would be that if they included facial recognition in my phone, I probably would go ahead and turn it on. Um, I would trust them, but uh, that's just again me personally. I would, uh, I would just say do your due diligence. Great. Okay, we have a couple more that are coming in. Um, mm -hmm. Susan asks, do you think a lot of our basic info, such as like our social security number, date of birth, etc., that we cannot change, are in the hands of bad people because of past breaches with maybe Equifax or eBay, etc.? Probably, yes. Um, you know, I know a lot of people have have been a uh, part of an employ unemployment scam that came out um, not too long ago. Um, you know, so there's credit report checks and things like that. There are services. I don't personally use any of those pay services to kind of protect. And you know, I I kind of feel like that's almost an extortion sometimes. But uh, if if I had been victim of identity theft, I probably would uh, subscribe to some sort of uh, service to keep an eye on that for me, right? Because that's their expertise. Great. And Gloria asks, is there any problem with clicking unsubscribe on unwanted emails? <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, Sometimes, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. It depends. There's my answer. Um, you know, I usually, I will hover over that link and I will look and I say, does this particular does this particular email look like, or the sender, am I going to trust if I click unsubscribe, do I believe they're actually going to, you know, unsubscribe me? If it's something I subscribe to in the first place, yes, they probably will take me off, but it's something I never asked for. If you click unsubscribe, you're basically telling them, yes, they found a human. Um, and uh, so sometimes you're giving them, you know, a hint that you exist and to, to try to communicate with you more. So, uh, that's one where you just got to, you know, use a critical eye and uh, ask yourself if you think that that, you know, on a case by case basis, because uh, sometimes you unsubscribe and you get three more subscriptions as a reward. Okay, we have um, another comment in, please talk about personal VPNs, how useful they are, how hard, uh, how hard are they to get and are they worth the price? Um, I don't use one I have in the past. Uh, I'm not, it's not something I'm really an expert on. Um, uh, so I can't, I can't really ask, I, can't, I don't really have an answer to that one. Again, do your due diligence, re, you know, look at some reviews, uh, um, usually the reviews of the application themselves or look at a third party, like perhaps PC Magazine or CNET um, and, they usually have pretty thorough uh, evaluations of, uh, of tools like that. Okay, another question. Um, sometimes you want to put something in spam and it won't let you. What do you do? Um, well, if you're, uh, if I, I guess I would just delete it. Um, if it'll let you delete it, uh, if it won't let you put it into your spam folder. Um, you know, it, uh, I would, depending on the context, I would say contact your help desk. If it's, you know, if it, if it's at Roosevelt, uh, if you forward that email, um, or you can, you know, contact us at the help, de at help desk at roosevelt.edu, you know, we can try to troubleshoot, uh, if it's something wrong with your email client or, um, to provide specific guidance on something like that. Call tech support. Hmm. tech support my best friend right. <laughs> i don't know what's going on um okay i don't see any more questions um 
coming in. So I think we can safely wrap up, but Dan, thank you so much for sharing all of this um, useful information for us and tips. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know I found a lot of value in this and I hope everyone joining us did too. Um, you know, of course, this is, this is technology is a part of our life and it's something we all need to be educated on and, and aware of. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time sharing your expertise um, and to everyone, uh, all of our participants joining today, this session will, uh, is recorded. So um, I will be sending out the recorded session. It'll also be posted on our lifelong learning page where all of our webinars are, our upcoming webinars and recorded sessions. So thank you so much. All right, thanks for having me. Have a thank great you. day, everyone. Thank you. Have a thank great you. afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you.